AI art has been a constant looming threat for the art community and everything artists love. And through it all, there's been so many people telling artists how to feel, what to do, what not to do. Start using this. No, start doing that. It's a lot. And for many, it's confusing and overwhelming. Because with all these sentiments regarding AI, there's still a lot of things that some just don't know. Or we may see others talking about it, but we don't understand. Sometimes it feels like people just can't even join in on the conversation. Well, luckily, you're at a good place to talk to an artist who also studies computer science. And I'd like to use this to give you a perspective you may not have heard from and just simply explain things about AI art in a way that's understandable and not too technical, so it's still accessible to those who don't understand a lot about AI art. What AI art is, how it works, how to avoid it, its flaws, and possibly how to beat it. And throughout this long video, I'm going to have timestamps for you so you can easily navigate through it all because there is a lot of information. Starting with what AI actually is. Most people know AI means artificial intelligence, but the whole idea of AI is to simulate human intelligence. Emphasis on the word simulate. A good and the earliest examples of this are old chatbots. This is a machine simulating human intelligence by trying to have a conversation as a human would. Shoot, the first program I ever made was a crappy little program that asked for your name and depending on your name, it would say certain things. And I made tailored responses for my friends' names to try and prank them and make them think the computer knew who they were. It was crappy, it was a bunch of just if-else statements, but hey, it's an example of a beginner trying to make an AI chatbot with no experience, no algorithms, just crappy code. But AI is much more powerful than that, especially now as we progress past crappy old chatbots and look at things like really complex chatbots and look at AI in games, search engines, your at-home assistants. But even still, AI is just code, math, and algorithms. And none of these applications are machines actually making conscious decisions the same way a human would. Just so you have a picture of what I mean by this, here's a basic example of what we call AI in a game, which is actually quite different from the AI we're going to talk about for the majority of this video. But this is just to give you a simple example that everyone can understand and get on the same page with. FNAF. Everyone knows it. You're in a room, there are monsters moving through a building trying to get to your room. At first glance, it could give off the appearance that the monsters are conscious and they're making decisions, but we know they aren't. It works like this under the hood. Each enemy has a number from 1 to 20 that scales with level difficulty. Every few seconds, the game has a movement opportunity where the game checks the enemy's numbers, and the higher the number, the more likely the enemy is to move. The enemies move in patterns towards your room, and if they get into the room, game over. A few conditionals with like doors and stuff, but yeah, that's like a bare bones description of how the animatronics work in FNAF, and people will call this the animatronic AI, but all it is is just a series of numbers and checks in the code of the game. We call it artificial intelligence because it seems like the monsters are strategically moving on their own, but they're not. It's just a layer of abstraction. No matter how smart we make the AI seem, it's just code and algorithms. The machine still needs to be told what to do. That's because computers are stupid. Very stupid. They can only do exactly what you tell it to, and if they do something different than what you told them to, it's because you made a mistake. Skill issue. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean computers and AI aren't powerful. The math, algorithms, and code needed to create a competent AI can get intense and beefy fast, but it still relies on human developers, which brings us to AI art. We have a basic understanding of really simple AI and how we can make monsters look like they're thinking in a game, but what about AI art? Well, AI art involves more than just giving an NPC a feeling of intelligence. AI art uses machine learning. Remember how AI simulates human intelligence? Well, now we are simulating human learning by training an AI model with some type of training data, which is huge because now with mathematical models and algorithms, we can make a computer start doing things without us actually having to hold their hand all the way through it. When people talk about AI, usually they're thinking of something using machine learning. There are plenty of examples of machine learning being used, like teaching a bot to walk, or what a popular YouTube thumbnail looks like, or chat GPT and social media using machine learning. For an example of machine learning and AI art, let's say I want the program to create a drawing of a fish. The model will shit itself. It's a machine. It doesn't know what a fish is. So we give it a picture and say, this is a fish. This is what a fish looks like. We want you to create an image of a fish. That picture is our training data. However, one picture is nowhere near enough training data for the model to actually grasp what a fish is. If we want good results, we want a lot of training data. So we give it a thousand, a hundred thousand, a million drawings and tell it to create a new drawing of a fish. The reason we want a lot of training data is because the machine is identifying patterns, and if we give it a lot of examples of a fish, it will start finding patterns that say, this is a fish, and it will start giving more accurate results. And for AI art, there are differences in how the AI uses the data and what type of patterns it's looking for. For example, diffusion and mimicry are both AI art, but they're different, but we're going to talk about them later. 
The model will analyze each image and then pop out something based on everything it just looked at in its data set. There are also some other factors such as positive and negative feedback we could give to the machine. We could look at what the model gives us and say, no, this is further from what I want, and the machine will take a new approach. Or we could say, yes, this is closer to what I want, and then the machine will try to hone in on the same approach it's finding success with. And remember, this machine isn't actually thinking like a human. It's responding to the feedback appropriately because the programs and algorithms we built into them. From the responses, the feedback, to the change of approach, it's all a lot of algorithms, logic, and code. And it's kind of cool, but extremely difficult. Because say you get it wrong, all of a sudden the machine is throwing out positive feedback and doubling down on negative feedback, or it never changed its methods, or it just doesn't work, period. It's a lot. But it's all under layers of abstraction, and that's the second time I've said this, so let me explain. Abstraction is the common practice of hiding from the user things they don't need to see in our code in order to use our code, or that we don't want them to see so they can't exploit our code. Example, do you know how the ice in your fridge works, the pipes, how it makes ice, where it's stored and how it gets there? No, you don't need to. All you do is push the button and ice comes out, assuming the ice machine has the necessary resources, which is actually an example of a contract. You, the client or user, meet the requirements of giving the fridge access to power and water, and I, the implementer or guy who made the fridge, guarantee that you get ice when you push the button. That's all you need to know to use it. It's the same with AI art or most things in technology, really. Shit, code is built off of other code that we, the coders, can't actually see. We just see the contract of some methods and we say, yep, that will work. Everything is built off of another layer and we don't need to see it. That's abstraction. And it goes deeper than just code. A program is built on vectors, vectors are built off numbers, while numbers and computers are just bits. Bits are just voltages, voltages are just electrons. Then you get into like quantum physics or some shit. But what I'm trying to say is, you don't need to understand the ones and the zeros, you don't need to know binary in order to make a simple Google search, but binary is still being used under many, many layers. Sorry for any of you confused by that, but don't worry, I'm done explaining abstraction. The reason I spent so much brain power explaining it is because that's what seems to cause a lot of confusion with AI art. People don't actually see everything that's going on under the hood, and when a client is using AI software to make fake art, they can't just skim through the files of the training data and go, oh wait, this, this is another artist's art. No, they can't see that. It's all hidden. All they know is for the contract, they put in an input and the model will generate an output based off of their input. They could put in the prompt anime girl and the program will generate an image of an anime girl. Now under the hood, the model could be using whatever the top post for hashtag anime girl is on Instagram or designs of the most popular anime girls of all time or 21,000 images of Hatsune Miku for their training data. The client wouldn't see all that. All they'd see is the output the model gives them. And that's where things get kind of icky because you can't steal other people's work to train your model. That's blatant theft. If the devs have some sort of a license they paid for the training data, then yeah, that's fine. That's moral. That's legal. They went to the owners and said, hey, can we pay to use your images to train our AI model? And the owners said, yep, and they gave them a license. Well, thing is, developers decide how they handle the training data. We don't. And they don't need to tell you if what they're using for was made with a license or not. The client won't really see what data was used to make their prompt, so there are people who are making AI art and they actually don't understand that they are most likely just stealing other artists' art because they can't see it out of sight, out of mind. And if an artist suggests their art was stolen, well then that's crazy because there's no proof. You can't see the training data. But AI art is weird because you actually kind of can see the training data through what the model gives you. That might sound confusing, so let me clarify. It's true, you can't just look at the database itself, but if I tell an AI to replicate a certain artist's style and the AI accurately spits out something that copies their style, that means the AI had to use that artist's art in some way. Because there's no way I can say, hey, give me something Jaden Animations, and the model just spits out something Jaden Animations without looking at Jaden Animations. The reality of it is, even though you can't really see the training data, it's very obvious if an artist's art is being used in some cases, especially cases of mimicry where an artist's art is directly used as input, then it's just obvious. But even beyond that, it's not a secret that a lot of the big AI art models are trained on the open web, meaning if it's on the internet, it can and will be turned into training data. And using an artist's art to generate AI art is stealing, and the people who are doing it know it. Like, they wouldn't just shoot the peace sign to Nintendo and say, hey, we're making an AI Mario game for profit, and we will be using every Mario game you've made as training data, 
without having a license for it, because the Nintendo ninjas would just wipe them off the face of the earth. It's a clear violation of copyright, so some devs who are stealing art have tried to find loopholes saying, well actually, they don't choose the training data, the model is actually just trained off of the open web based on prompts, it's all out there, so it's all fair use. There's no way you can tell if something's actually stolen or not, or even some AI companies have tried to become exempt from copyright. There's a lot of legal things going on, but unfortunately, I'm not a lawyer or a law major, I am just a comp sci guy. <laughs> but you don't have to be a lawyer to see that things are getting a little intense on the legal side of AI-generated images. There have been plenty of lawsuits filed by artists, and many people are expressing their concern and need for stricter laws on AI. And lawmakers are getting to work, though it's all been kind of a crawl. Which isn't really good that it's been a crawl, because the AI-generated images have progressed rapidly as they freely use anything in sight for training data. But while I'm not a lawyer, I do know one thing. When something exploits people for the sake of productivity, it usually won't be handled urgently. In fact, it might be embraced by companies. But once something exploits companies or people with money, oh boy. <laughs> And that's what's happening. Big media companies have been stolen from by AI and have filed massive lawsuits against AI companies. Even celebrities are having deepfakes made of them, one being Taylor Swift, who recently had some insane, disgusting deepfakes made of her that went extremely viral on the internet that brought massive attention to the issues AI-generated images can cause. Taylor Swift even announced that she was considering taking legal action. So AI-generated images are in a lot of hot water, AI art included, and lawmakers are currently trying to make decisions, but while we wait for that, many are preparing for the worst and preparing for AI art to become a part of the art industry. We've heard a lot of takes that artists should start specializing in AI, which I understand the sentiment coming from someone who isn't an artist, because yes, if AI takes a job, a human being who did that job will always be needed because the AI needs some human supervision. Remember, computers are stupid. It will make mistakes, it will pump out a product that is flawed. So say AI becomes part of the animation industry. Let's be real, or can never hope to partake in animation itself, but if say a storyboard artist were replaced, not only would you need an artist who understands to input the prompts, but you also couldn't rely on just the storyboards the AI pumps out. They'd have to be revised, preferably by a human. So if AI were to replace roles in the animation pipeline, it would cut out the non-lead roles, like the rough storyboard artists, the assistant character and background designers, all roles that make the roughs and submit it to their leads for revisions. Meaning senior and lead roles on the teams would probably keep their positions, but be forced to work with AI. That's true for most instances of AI taking over jobs. Shit, it's happening to some of my family members who are now being forced to get certifications in AI so they can supervise the AI that's replacing those below them. One content creator named Omni was pretty big on the sentiment that artists need to start specializing in AI and hope to keep their jobs. And yeah, again, it's a logical argument from someone who's not an artist, but guess what? If that were to happen, not only would many artists still lose their jobs, but what we love to do, even if we did still keep our position, wouldn't be what we love to do anymore. Yes, for many careers, you can switch things up and put AI in there and cut out the middleman, and for those who didn't get decimated and lose their jobs to it, it might feel like the same bullshit as usual. Oh great, corporate is just pushing new software down our throats. What else is new? I still do the same thing, give or take some pipeline changes. With art though, it doesn't matter if you are the assistant putting in prompts or the lead making revisions, it's not the same. The beauty of art and animation is the fact that it's coming from a human, and it cannot exist without humans. The problems that arise are the decisions that are made by the artists. How do we break down this cat into shapes that say friend? How do we give this mouse a personality? How do we get the viewers to focus on this key as Maleficent puts it in her pocket? How do we portray that that character has power over this character just through storyboarding alone? How do we draw the viewer's eyes from character 1 to character 2's action in this scene? Art is built on human decisions, decisions that are driven by emotion and feeling. It's the beauty of what makes art art, and a lead character designer being forced to revise some slop a machine put out is a completely different job. Artists become artists to create, not babysit AI that tries to replicate how they would have created. So while it's a logical argument from people who aren't artists, it's not the correct play. And those who still insisted it was were confused why they got so much slack from artists for insisting it was. But that's because nearly every artist knows that's not what we want, that's not what we do. And we have people who aren't artists telling us how to feel about what we do. We're the artists, we're the ones who makes the art, not them. I don't need you to come in and say, well actually, I should be doing this. I know, I'm not stupid, I know that that's a possibility, but it's not an option, that's why we're fighting against it. So what else can we do? 
Well, we could take matters into our own hands while we wait for lawmakers to take action. We know a lot of AI art steals from artists, so we could try to protect our own art while we can. Or individually try striking back at AI. Or organize and strike back at AI. Now, there are actually many ways we could go about this. The first is the obvious, which is staying away from platforms that have given in to AI art. While some platforms are very vague on their use of AI and will just say, hey, we use your data to train AI models, which could mean AI art, but also more likely could just mean other less harmless AI like chatbots or search tools. There are some platforms that will tell you, hey, we're straight up training AI art models. Stay away from those platforms read their terms of service, or just look it up on Google and it'll just link you to their terms of service. Next, we can go back to how AI art works. Remember, it uses our art as training data, but how does it actually look at our art and the training data? Well, again, we don't know exactly what the algorithms look like under the hood, but we generally know it's looking for patterns. It's all pattern recognition. Okay, so let's think of a few types of AI art we mentioned earlier. One example we have was diffusion. Diffusion is where the model takes an image and by imitating what it's been trained on, it creates new data. It basically gets a taste of some art and starts pumping out new AI art that tries to taste the same as that art did. Usually by doing something like adding a shit ton of noise and then reversing it to get something new yet similar. Or another example is mimicry, where AI might not make something entirely new, but it does take an image and turns it into a style of another input. For example, we have that image of a fish, but I want it to look like Claude Monet painted it. So I give the AI model the fish picture, give it Claude Monet art, and then it fuses that style together and it tries to copy Claude Monet's meticulous and beautiful textured brushwork, and then it puts my fish in Claude Monet's style. Okay, there are other things AI can do to our art, but we have a few perspectives on how some models will look at our art. So now we can try to think of some flaws it would have. So what now? Well, let me look at my art. If AI stacked all my art on top of each other and looked for patterns, what would it get? Well, I don't think it would have trouble copying my anatomy, my lines, my faces, or even how I use color. But there's this weird thing I do where I just leave splotches of color sitting there. That's a human decision I make. It's because I'm colorblind and if I lose a certain color I was using as I started layering colors onto my piece, I'm not gonna be able to recreate that color by just eyeballing it. Other humans, and especially other artists, could probably immediately see these blotches and recognize, oh, that guy is just leaving his color palette on the piece. But the AI doesn't really know why I do that. It doesn't see this as often as, say, it sees eyes or a nose, and it doesn't really know what these are. So. What if the AI tried to recreate my style by scanning everything I posted on Twitter? Well, I think it would be pretty noticeable when there are splotches that don't seem right or don't fit, they're just kind of floating there. Or since there will be a lot more training data in the system than just my art, it might try to turn these color splotches into something they're not, like jewelry, which will look really awful and painfully noticeable. And that is actually something we've seen quite a bit of in AI art. While AI has gotten better about things like hands and, well, it kind of still sucks at hair, AI art has seemed to struggle with words or random marks or any abnormalities left in the artist's piece. Artist's watermarks get turned into random jumbles of letters that blend into clothes. Color palettes get morphed into hair. The reason most AI art models struggle with this is the same reason the models struggled with hands and feet in the past. These things aren't as prominent in every artist's art. Stack every Instagram artist or Twitter artist art into one massive pile and run through it. Look for patterns. The human face is seen a ton. It's a given, especially if we're just looking through art of people. And because of this, the AI will handle creating a face just fine. But hands aren't drawn as often or as consistently as the face. So the AI used to struggle terribly with drawing accurate hands, and most still do. It's the same with watermarks and random things, but even worse, since they're just spontaneous. If you're a machine, like, what's going on here? It's not prominent. These artists are making different markings for different reasons. There's no correct pattern the AI can find. Of course, simply adding words or color splotches or other random marks won't make you immune to AI and it probably won't completely destroy the training data. In fact, if all artists started writing words into their art to try to combat AI, AI would probably eventually adapt to the same way it did with the hands, although I don't think it would be easy. Also, devs could just try to make something where the AI starts filtering out color splotches or filters out letters and just ignores them. But that does up the complexity a bit. It's not a failsafe, it's not guarantee protection, and any good dev team could probably solve these issues with enough time, but it does make you slightly more annoying for the model to deal with. And if you're in a crowd of very susceptible people and you're just slightly more difficult to rob, that would help. And it's a good example of what I know most of you have been waiting for me to talk about, or you might have just already skipped to this part. Because models can still use your art. 
it probably wouldn't want to use your art too much because your complexity might make it have to toss out a few outputs, but I don't want to just be an annoyance. I want to be the bane of their existence, the thorn in their side. Well, just as there are devs who are trying to find ways to improve AI art and make it easier to exploit artists, there are devs who are doing the opposite and trying to create software to help protect artists' art, such as Glaze or another big one that everyone's heard of, Nightshade. And a lot of artists, I mean a lot, have no clue what Nightshade actually does or what Glaze actually does. Like many other artists just straight up said that they were holding off on making a video on Nightshade because they actually don't know if it's reliable or not. So let's discuss how it works right now. At a surface glance, both Glaze and Nightshade, they seem similar in how they work, but they are in fact different and both have different purposes, and this is important. They both basically make changes to the image in order to tamper with the way AI models will see the art. Nightshade essentially focuses on tricking the AI into interpreting something incorrectly and training itself incorrectly, essentially poisoning the AI's training data, which is why Nightshade is called Nightshade because poisonous plant. Good name. Anyways, these changes are not visible to the human eye, but are supposed to be impactful to the AI. It does this by making these changes at the pixel level, changing the shading values and making an object look like another object to the AI that analyzes every little pixel. Night shading an image of a fish in the water will make it look the same to our human eyes, but when AI tries to look at it, it'll see something else in the water, like a sushi roll, thus messing with the AI and poisoning its training data. While Nightshade is an offensive approach, Glaze is a more defensive approach. It focuses less on poisoning the AI's training data and more on protecting from style mimicry. Mimicry was our example of turning a fish into a Claude Monet style painting. Glaze also makes minimal changes to artworks that humans can't really notice with our eyes, but instead of trying to trick the AI into seeing different content, it focuses on changing the style for the AI's perspective. So now when someone tries to make their fish look like it was drawn in, let's say, flavored tissue style, if tissues glaze their art, we wouldn't notice any changes, but the person using the nightshaded art as a prompt would get an output that is nothing like tissue style, and they won't know why basically making tissues art unable to be mimicked, assuming it's been glazed. It's important to note that for both glaze and nightshade, you can't easily get rid of the effects by taking a screenshot or cropping or tampering with noise or compression, etc. Because these changes are made directly to the image itself. In order to reverse the effects of glaze and nightshade, the attacker would basically have to know the exact key of how nightshade and glaze tampered with the images and be able to reverse it from scratch. But the way Glaze and Nightshade operates on the art changes and is different for every single art piece. It's kind of like a form of encryption. Now what this does is it starts sort of an arms race, because like cybersecurity, there is no one solution. There is no, oh we stopped them, we get to go home early guys. No, there are developments, there are new ways around it. That's why cybersecurity gets paid so good, because every day you're fighting some new shit and every month you're getting a new certification. Glaze and Nightshade are kind of in a similar state against AI art. It's not, as the devs put it, future-proof, and eventually AI devs will probably find a way around them, and Nightshade and Glaze will have to find a way to be back, causing this back-and-forth battle. Just like our other not-as-technical example of adding color splotches and letters, there will be a workaround. Of course, Nightshade and Glaze are way more useful against AI than just adding some complexity to your work. There are still some other limitations to Nightshade and Glaze. Changes made by both software normally aren't visible to the human eye, but with art that has really flat colors and smooth backgrounds, it will become more visible. Remember, the software is making changes and hiding it in the complexity of your work. If your art isn't really complex, it'll still have to make changes that you might notice if you look too hard. Also, it's important to notice Nightshade does not do Glaze's job and vice versa. Nightshade attacks and poises AI training data. Glaze makes it extremely difficult for your style to be copied by AI. The devs recommend that you use both and are currently working on a way for Nightshade to coexist with Glaze in one software. Also, some say for Nightshade to actually negatively impact AI training data, you would need a large amount of Nightshaded art to get into the dataset to affect the AI in any reasonable way. But Nightshade actually seems more efficient than you'd think. After some research, it seems that a handful of these images can actually shake up a model's sample data pretty well. And the only good way you can fix an AI model that's been trained on these poison images would be to go into the data and remove them yourself, which would be a bitch to do. And you could try to automate this, but we know AI detection software isn't all that. It seems the only option a dev would have is to spend tons of resources to find a way to automate the process of cleaning the poison samples from their data, or do it manually, both of which would be a terrible experience. Of course, people are already trying to develop tools to get around Nightshade, but it's easier said than done. Nightshade and Glaze are both AI that is fighting AI, 
And now people are trying to make AI to fight the AI that fights the AI. It's complicated. <laughs> but I would recommend using Nightshade and Glaze. They're both free tools, and even if the AI devs do start finding a workaround for Glaze and Nightshade, both softwares will be helpful in making you a more difficult target. Think of it like having a stronger password than your buddy beside you. Why would I bother with your complex, annoying ass password when I could go for the guy whose password is QWERTY1234? Why would I try to use your art again when the last time I used it, I had to skim through my entire data set, clean it, and retrain my model? Also, it's important to realize AI is also recently having a struggle with other AI being mixed into its training data, essentially poisoning the data with itself. This is happening because a lot of AI is using the open web to find training data. Thing is, there's a lot of AI art flying around the open web, and that's a pretty big problem for AI art models that are using the open web for training data, especially because there's no way to automatically detect AI with AI detection software. We know this because we've had multiple incidents of AI detection software not properly flagging AI generated images, causing companies like fucking Wacom to end up using AI art for their promos. So even if they were to avoid nightshaded art, they could still possibly run into other AI art, which is not good for their model because sure, maybe the AI that was picked up wasn't that bad, but training AI art with AI art can cause a type of genetic bottleneck effect, essentially making it regress on itself. So no matter how doomed you think it is, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for AI art either. Yeah, I know it's hard to keep your chin up when you got some people waving flags and screaming, the end is near. But remember, we have ways of fighting AI. We have our voices, our art, our community, the legal system, even though it's extremely slow. We have AI to fight the AI. Just because AI art is strong doesn't mean it's flawlessly taking over. It's, it's not. No matter how many AI bros come into your comments to say it is, trust me, as someone who is constantly learning more and more about software engineering and development every single day, and is always learning about AI, yeah, AI has really taken off, but AI art? not as good as you think. Whew, that was a lot, but that was good. I hope you're able to learn something through all this. I just wanted to be able to gather everything I already knew and have been learning and give it to you guys so you can come out with a better understanding of everything. Because learning about everything through Twitter is not good and definitely doesn't feel good. Because AI is very complicated, as I've said 10 times throughout this video, but it really is, which is why I try to keep things light with a general description of AI and how these softwares work instead of diving extremely in depth and giving you college level AI lectures and then talking about linear algebra and crazy ass algorithms because then this video wouldn't feel accessible like at all. Also, this was a very big chunky video for me and there was a lot of organizing of info I had to do. So to other computer science nerds, if there's something I missed or something I said that started off, let me know. But I hope this helped you. And if it did, tell me in the comments and also ask more questions that you might have and tell me what you think. Are you considering using Nightshade and Glaze? Do you think AI even has a chance in something like the animation industry? It doesn't, let's be real. Also, if you like the video, actually like it. It helps me out a lot or subscribe to me to see more of my videos. But that's all I have for now. I'll see you guys.